Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, next uh, meetup with uh, Gary Fowler. And I'm really excited to, for this event. Gary is a well known entrepreneur. Derek uh, Distanfield is also a well known entrepreneur, but he will be, uh, he will be doing an uh, introduction of Gary and have some uh, um, QA session with him. Before I do any uh, slides uh, and show any slides, um, I would like to say that uh, we want to keep it a small uh, uh, meeting uh, just to let you guys answer your, uh, ask your questions. Uh, there will be some talk between Gary and uh, Derek, but uh, feel free to ask questions uh, like in the chat. And once they finish uh, their conversation, I think we can turn on our microphones uh, when we have questions and just ask questions. So I think it will be fun. Um, let me open my presentation quickly. All right. Sharing the screen, just a second. Can you see my screen? I guess so. All right. So uh, welcome to the meetup again. Uh, we will be talking about driving chaos, uh, going global to win with Gary Fowler. Uh, Derek and Gary will talk about this more uh, in a few moments. I, so uh, this event is under Go Global Community and GSD. We, uh, I'm the founder of the Go Global Community. Uh, basically, uh, the idea of the community is to help entrepreneurs to be connected uh, with Silicon Valley. And uh, since uh, um, we have a lot of connections with uh, United States uh, uh, startup ecosystem, we give you this chance to be closer to successful people and ask questions directly and maybe do sometimes business with them. Never know. Your role is to help uh, your peers in the community to, with connections, uh, advice, uh, recommendations, Whatever possible, uh, and you can do. So uh, our recent events uh, we did with uh, some of the great speakers. Uh, there was uh, uh, Medina Islam, one of the uh, first uh, speakers, and he is a Hollywood actor and entrepreneur. There was Bob Dorf um, speaking about survival math. Uh, he's a well-known guy as well. Um, Rand Antonino as a great entrepreneur who managed to uh, uh, grow his company with a very limited capital. Uh, Derek Distinfield is a known entrepreneur and he spoke about customer development in the United States. And I had a few talks as well about how to start a company, how to raise capital, and so on. Our next speakers, uh, our next events will be, uh, next speaker will be on April 30th. Uh, we'll talk about how to research the competition with Andrew Wasserman. Uh, he's uh, the founder of Logic, and uh, he also uh, a great entrepreneur. Uh, he's a mentor at Stanford, and uh, I know these guys pretty well. He, he has a lot of insights for you to share. Um, there will be also another uh, great entrepreneur who is working right now on a flying car, uh, Evgeny Duhovny. He he's the CEO of Armada, also a well-known uh, uh, entrepreneur. He raised from famous VC fund uh, a good amount of money for his flying car, and he will be talking about uh, Silicon Valley history uh, by entrepreneur. But those two events will be in Russian. Um, the next speaker will be Bill Reichert, a famous, uh, uh, successful uh, investor and entrepreneur. He will talk about how, how to successfully fundraise in our uh, very strange environment uh, uh, during pandemic times. Uh, and the uh, famous uh, person for Russian entrepreneurs, David Yang, uh, he'll be talking about growing a global corporation. Uh, so follow us. Uh, I'll, I announce those events in the Telegram channel. Uh, you can register and also send you the links in the chat today. Uh, so, uh, if you're not on the community, this is the link to join. You can search uh, Go Global Russia in English on Telegram or just scan this barcode. I uh, will help you to get right in there. 
next. If you need uh, more than just a little bit of help uh, uh, through the community, uh, and you want to start your business in the United States, and you need really uh, deep expertise, you can contact me directly. This has all, those are my contacts. You can scan them, and uh, we can help you through GSD to uh, start your business in the United States. Uh, this is my uh, recent article on vc.ru uh, about, uh, I, I give my recommendations for startups at uh, 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 different stages, how to raise capital and what to do. Uh, I hope you like it. Uh, I'll send you the link. Uh, and in the bottom of this article, you can find a database of investors. You, so it should help you to raise capital sooner. So what about the rules uh, during uh, today's presentation? Uh, feel free to ask questions while Gary and Derek talk. Uh, please uh, speak uh, English only. Uh, if you have problems with English, uh, ask me, I can translate, but I'm sure everyone speaks English. And uh, uh, while Gary and Derek talk, please keep yourself muted. Once we allow everyone to speak, uh, please turn on your camera and uh, uh, Speak, speak one at a time so we don't have too many people talking right away. Um, so Derek Distanfield is a famous uh, entrepreneur, I would say, in Russia and in the United States. He was uh, running uh, a fa like a successful company, uh, Payment 360. They took it from zero to two billion dollars. Uh, he also managed, uh, uh, he was leading a, a well-known accelerator bank labs and uh, helped like hundreds of entrepreneurs to start companies. Uh, he also a like, co-founder and the COO of GSD Venture Studios. So Derek will present Gary Fowler uh, and they will talk about thriving in chaos and going global. I'll let you talk guys, uh, so you can take it from here. Thank you very much everyone. Hey everyone, and Daniil, thank you for that introduction. Uh, as Daniil said, I am going to speak with Gary and talk to him about the many, many different things that he has done and the many learning experiences that, that he has learned. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat if there's something you can't wait to ask Gary at the end that you feel is relevant for the discussion. I uh, may or may not answer it during the chat or we'll get to it at the end. But by and large, the goal is for everyone to learn not just about Gary, but learn what he's learned during his very diverse past. Um, the one thing that you may not know about Gary is he is one of the most caring, devoted people I have ever had the pleasure of, of doing business with. And um, I am sure that if he does not know an answer to your question, he will find that person that knows the answer. Because besides being hyper caring, he's also hyper connected. And I, I think of Gary as a hyper connector. And I think as, as he goes through his uh, experience, he'll teach you a little bit about that. The last thing I would say that Gary is, is he's a pit bull and um, you know, there's puppy dogs, there's hot dogs, and there's pit bulls. And Gary is, is the pit bull and that relentless effort that he puts towards things um, is something that I've learned a, a lot from and, and maybe you guys will too. So without further ado, I'm just going to give Gary a quick chance to open up with an introduction about himself because he can do it much better than, than I can. Great, thanks, Derek. So uh, I've been in startups for over 28 years. I've done 15 companies. Uh, most recently, I did a company prior to GSD with David Yang, the founder of Abby. So we have a venture fund and also Eva.ai. So I co-founded Eva with, with David. And so one of the things, you know, uh, going through it, uh, I've done companies, most technology-oriented companies, most of the recent companies are AI companies because AI is where the future is, right? It's going to touch all of us in different ways. So I believe there's a great opportunity. And with my own background, you know, we look at today and people say, you know, we're, we're in a chaotic situation and pandemic. 
but I've seen these a lot of times in different ways. And I'll give you for instance, a few years ago, I was approached by a venture capital group called Oak Investment Partners, one of the top tier. And they said to me, would you like to join a team of Israelis and Russians? And the company's called IET. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about it. Well, it's AI, it's algorithmic math, uh, et cetera. Would you be interested? Would you talk? Sure. So we met. The company was not doing very much in revenue. It was a very technology oriented CEO, PhD in math. So we took this little tiny company in a bad situation. The timing was bad. The market had tanked and we believed in the dreams. We did the, we went down through the financials. We set the company up. I renamed the company click software and with click software came up with a family of products, click fix, click analyze, click mobile. A deal with the SAP, a business development deal. Now, guys, this was in nine months. That company that was probably not going to be in business did an IPO in NASDAQ. And the company was sold six months ago, the company that I was on the original management team, for $1.35 billion. Now, what does it take? You know, Derek was right on target. And uh, I love Derek, he's the same cut in terms of get shit done. But if you don't believe and you don't try, the chance of success, guys, ain't gonna happen. And now in uncertain times, it's not about fear driving you. So we can, we can talk about that further, but you have to believe in what you have. You have to believe in a very succinct, ordered fashion that you can take this out to market. So. We can talk about, you know, I have some new ideas. I'm actually writing another article in Forbes magazine. I wrote one a couple of weeks ago about thriving in a time of crisis. But there's three things that I think are incredible that we haven't really looked at. Intergenerational teams. Teams where you got a mixed team. You've got uh, young right out of MIPT or wherever they've graduated from. And at the same time, you've got people that are seasoned veterans. So I believe that this new intergenerational team is gonna have a dramatic, dramatic impact on the startups because it helps you get, it's like having a, a GPS system, a navigator. And also multicultural and regionally diverse. So we'll get into a little bit uh, about, that, uh, about that later. Uh, Derek, you said there were some questions you wanted to ask me and I don't wanna go off talk. Yeah, no. Um what I think is most interesting is that first business you had right out of college and, you know, talk about that, how you really kind of grew that as a young, as kind of a young whippersnapper with no, no experience. And, and what did you learn from, from that first construction tech industry? So that company, so I was right out of graduate school. I didn't know whether I wanted to go, Continue, I was a master's degree in clinical psychology, undergraduate business in clinical psychology. I was thinking about going to be a doctor. So I thought, I thought to myself, I'm not sure I really want to do it, but uh, so what's interesting? So th an incredible thing, I went down to a magazine uh, bookstore and I picked up a magazine and it had a design of a house. And I thought this was the coolest thing I'd ever seen, this house. And uh, at the same time, I was taking martial art, arts classes. I was taking jujitsu in the mornings, four days a week, privately. <laughs> I went into the instructor and he said to me, he said, I'm out of work. And I said, well, you know, you're a jujitsu instructor. He said, no, no, I'm a contractor. So this is going to take rocket science, right? So here's a contractor that needs work. Uh, and I looked at these designs of these houses. Now remember, I had no money, right? But done. So what did I do? I ended up uh, going to work for a distributor selling Apple computers. I used the money from the Apple computers so I could get a loan to, to build a house. I completely redesigned the inside of that house. Four bedrooms, two and a half baths because there weren't those houses in that area. I came up with a design, I put the house on a market on a sketch, and I sold the house in one month after I put it up on a sketch 
for 38% profit. I completed the house in four months. Then I decided to do two houses because I said, hey, this is great. So what other kind of houses? So I built two houses. The uh, margin on those was 35% apiece. And then I decided there weren't any really big houses. So I started big, building houses uh, over 6,000 square feet, 600 meters. And people said, nobody's gonna buy them. Well, it was just luck, right? So I bought a mountain. Yeah, I'm 22 years old. I bought a part of a mountain. I put a, um, a, uh, a um, uh, rate of first refusal on the mountain. And people said, it's never gonna have water, right? You're gonna have to use septic systems. Uh, it's the never gonna have water, never gonna have gas, et cetera. Well, I took an option. I said, I gave the person $5,000. I said, if it doesn't get it, what's a big deal? You can sell it to somebody else. But I just went first right of refusal. Well, guess what happened? Three months later, water, gas, uh, sewer came in. These price of these lots went through the roof and I owned the majority of the hill, the mountain. So I built a house. My first house, I made $120,000 in six months. Now, this was a number of years ago, right? 25 years ago. It was a lot of money. And so then I said, well, geez, I'll do the same model. I'll build two of them. And so in the second one, I made like 150, 160, and it just started growing from there. I built 27 houses. But the thing is, people said I couldn't do it, Derek. They said it couldn't be done. And if I had to listen to my dad, Gary, you go to school, be a doctor. Why in the world would you want to do that? And I said, dad, because I have a passion for it. And I did it. So the lessons learned was believe in yourself. I took personal loans out. So I didn't have any kind of venture funding. I took loans from the bank. I used credit cards. I did everything that I could to get the funding of those. And it paid off. So I'm not saying it was all easy because there are some rough times. I made a mistake. I started to believe my own bullshit. And I put a blue carpet in a house because I like blue. Well, guess what? You don't put non-neutral colors in an in a 6,700 square foot house. So the women would come in and said, it doesn't match any of my refrigerator. I have a brown couch. <laughs> and I thought I had to go back, pull the carpet up and put hardwood floors in the whole house. Wasn't there another time where you learned how to listen to customers and frame the house in a way that it was something they wanted? Um, yeah. So that was, that was uh, the carpeting thing, but on the, uh, so I've had those experience too. I had somebody, I put a, an entire house up and the customer came back to me and said, I love the house, but I want a bedroom on top of the garage. Now imagine the house is entirely framed and started to be plumbed. And he said, I want a bedroom on top of the garage. Now you imagine all the support issues you would have. And I want an indoor swimming pool in the back of the house. So, and he said, can you do it? I said, absolutely. Absolutely. So I got an architect. I redesigned the house. I pulled the roof off the garage. I took the framing out, ripped it up, and made exactly what the customer wanted. Now, it wasn't easy, and people said, you don't want to do it. Just finish the house, et cetera, but I did it. I did it and got it done. And uh, the carpet thing was where I didn't listen to. Everybody said use neutral colors, and I thought I knew better. And that ex was a very, very, very expensive lesson. Because, um, ah, and the other thing I found that was really interesting on one of the houses uh, is that people said to me, they said, uh, uh, I'm coming into the house, I want the family room up front and the living room in the back. The, 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 the dimensions were exactly the same. Nothing was different, nothing. And so the woman looked at it and I said, oh, I think I've got it reversed, I was joking. I said, it is, the living room's up front. She said, I'll take the house. This is my dream house. Nothing had changed. So sometimes you gotta understand that you, you've gotta uh, think differently about these things. And once I showed her that, and I showed her what it would look like, I took pieces of, of uh, furniture and showed her how it would fit in that room. She loved it. Nothing was different with it. So fast forward to, the early 90s you previously hadn't been to Russia what what 
caused you to visit Russia the first because time? It's an enigma. It was an enigma. And uh, what happened with Russia is that I was working for, so I know Scott McNeely. He was one of the founders of Sun. And he said, uh, I have an opportunity open in Russia to be a country manager. We'd be interested. So this was 1991. And I said to myself, this is, uh, this is um, uh, interesting for me. So I went over to Russia and I was over there for a few days. I had done some research. Uh, I, I met some girl online, but I went over there and proposed. And I ended up uh, marrying a Russian girl who was a computer engineer. I did a lot of research on her. I talked to her a lot. But anyhow, I went over there and I just became entirely fascinated with Russia because there's so much opportunity. It's like a, um, it's like a beautiful present in a, in a box that doesn't have a lot of wrapping on it. But once you open up the box, you see things that are very special. So I went over and I understood people were afraid. And so as we went down through from the 90s through uh, working with Lawrence Wright and starting Startup Academy at Skolkova and GVA, I just, there's untapped talent. There's like some of the best technical talent in the world is located in Russia. And it's just untapped because of geographically, you know, Novosibirsk or Omsk or Vladivostok, it's just, and, and it's not easy to get to. So I saw that and it's, you know, it's simple. It's just like the house stuff, right? Once I put the, the house on that land, it became extremely valuable. And that's incredible opportunity today. And then you, that also, that passion that you spoke about earlier also led to a paper that you did at Stanford on bilateral Russian and U.S. relations. Could you yeah, tell people really about that? Yeah, so what happened, this was in 2000, and I wrote a paper at Stanford called Bad Bilateral Technology Trade Between the U.S. and Russia. Nobody had done a tech technology event between the U.S. and Russia, and I got Anatoly Karachinsky from IBS, which is one of the wealthiest Russian um, uh, oligarchs, uh, to support it. And in six weeks, I put together an event. Of course, it wasn't just me, but I spearheaded it. And it was kind of funny. I'll never forget this because I went into the Commerce Department of the U.S. And I told the guys what I was going to do. And he said, oh, Gary, you can't do it because we've, we've broken down the relationship between the Commerce Secretary and Minister Raymond. And I said, I don't care. I'm a businessman. It doesn't matter. I said, it's, I said will you be supportive? He said, I will be supportive if you're successful. Those were his exact words. <laughs> I said, now... I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come back and you're going to buy me a drink. If I pull this thing off, give me eight weeks. I'm saying six. Give me eight. If I pull the thing off, I just want you to promise that you'll be, uh, that you'll be supportive when we go out for a drink. He said, absolutely. Well, we pulled it off. I got Velohoff from the Kurchatovsky Institute, Karachinsky, Esther Dyson, and um, I got them to come in. And it actually changed the relationship. Imagine this is the first big event between the US and Russia, and that was out in Silicon Valley. And that became the Global Technology Symposium today with Alexandra Johnson. That's what came out of that uh, paper. But the thing is, people said it couldn't be done. And the history of all the startups that I've done, I can't say one that people said it could be done, even, even with David, none of them. And we do it. It's a matter of, you know, having the right kind of grit to be able to get through it and believe in your dreams. So is that the paper that kind of led to the idea of, of Startup, Startup Academy and, and GVA? Or, or how did that all come about? No, no. So what happened with that paper? So that was to basically open up the relationship. Kierczynski and those folks had not come up. Kierczynski is really famous uh, with Softline and IBS, et cetera. So it opened up a door a beautiful door and it started this thing and it started to the traffic between Silicon Valley and Russia, people starting to get to know each other. And that's, so with GVA and with Startup Academy, I basically took it to the next level. So I understood that this core, core skill sets didn't exist in Russia and from startups. So I got Steve Blank and Bob Dorf, Guy Kawasaki involved and 
just like this, started to do events, started to talk about it, came up with a program to take them over to the US so people could see what it's like. And, and with GVA, we took the next level. There have been what, 6,000 startups involved in GVA at this point and hundreds of them from Startup Academy. But by the way, in each one of those things, people said it couldn't be done. You're never gonna do this. Why would I wanna go to, these are the Russians. Why would I ever wanna go to Silicon Valley? Uh, there's nothing there that we don't have in Russia. And once they went, people, eight out of 10 would say, I wanna stay. It was unbelievable. I don't know if it was the weather or the environment, but this is, you know, you gotta try. You gotta take that step forward because you don't know what you don't know. And how many companies went through GVA? Well, we've had thousands of them now. So, I mean, there's uh, about 6,000 companies in different ways of going through uh, GVA. Uh, so we became the accelerator for uh, IKEA. So the mega accelerator. So it went beyond what I re originally started and it's grown and grown and grown and Zamir's amazing. I've uh, grown the company, Daniel. But the thing is, somebody's got to plant those seeds. And they have to take a chance. You, you mentioned taking a chance, and you really seem to get invigorated when people doubt you. But where does that come from, like deep down? Was that like part of your upbringing, or how did you learn that? Uh, so... The thing that really hit at home, there's two things that really did it, uh, that put it on the map. And I remember when I was a kid, I bought a black belt out of a magazine and I put it down in my uh, basement. I had a room down in the basement where we had a TV room and I hung it on the wall. And every day I went down there, I would look at that black belt. And my father said to me, uh, you know, my father's very supportive, but he said, Gary, why do you want that black belt up there? And he said, it doesn't even fit you. It's too big. I said, because I'm going to wear it, Dad. <laughs> and, and so I would bring my friends down. And what happened from that is I ended up becoming uh, number two in the state of Pennsylvania in judo. And then I got two black belts. So it's a man visualize and a materialize. And so that dream came true. And then when I was in university, when I was in high school, I didn't like to study very much. And I graduated in the bottom quartile in high school. And I decided I wanted to go to college. And so what I did is I read a book a day for about five months, I guess, total. A book, one 300-page book, every single day. By the end of that time, I graduated in the top of my college class. And I think I was number six or so out of 400. And so if a guy like me can do it, anybody can do it, right? It's like, it's a matter of focusing, getting shit done, and having some fun while you're doing it. Just last week, I didn't think I could ride 208 miles on a bicycle in a week. And I put my mind to it. It's like, if you put your mind to it and you try, you never know till you try, right? So everybody in this audience has the same opportunity. Well, I don't know if I should do it. I'm really comfortable in Russia. I'm comfortable in this situation. Try. Yeah, I remember one time, this is a, I remember, you got to hear this thing. It's, so I went to this bar one time and the most beautiful woman I had ever seen was standing on the other side of the bar. And I was standing with these guys and they said to me, you see that girl? I said, yeah. The guy said, that is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen. And she was talking to a guy. And I said, okay, and what? And he said, oh, it's just amazing. You know, I don't want to get the guy upset with us. So anyhow, I walked over and I said to her, I said, hi, my name's Gary. Nice to meet you. And she said, yeah, I'm Susan. And this is my uh, cousin, Mark. It came with me. She said, this is the weirdest place. Nobody wants to ask me to dance or anything. And I said, well, that's why I came over. <laughs> I started dating her. <laughs> so you never know till you try. You know, you gotta, I bought a car in the back of a magazine one time. I saw a Lamborghini. And I couldn't believe that the same cover car that was on the front of the magazine was in the back in the classified ads. I called the guy up. Now, I didn't need a Lamborghini Countach. Believe me, it's the last thing I needed. 
I called the guy up and I said, do you the guy, is this the same car? It has Ferrari wheels. I saw it on the magazine. He said, it is. And I said, what's going on? He said, I need to sell it right now. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm getting divorced. And I said, well, the car's like a $180,000 car. He said, I'll sell for $35,000. I said, I'll take it. I bought a freaking Lamborghini Countach. <laughs> Believe it. They brought it up to my house and I got a Lamborghini. And then I sold it to Japan and made 30%. So if you don't ask, you never know, right? That's what life's all about. Ask. I know that, you know, Steve Blank talks a lot about that the definition of a startup is an experiment to create a reputable, repeatable business model. And, you know, not all experiments come true, but you, you bet on the scientists, not the experiment itself. Do you feel that that, that culture is, is a little bit unique to Silicon Valley or at least more acceptable than some parts of the world? Or... Is that something that we need to export, just that comfortable of trying and not succeeding and then trying again? Could you well, maybe- I mean, The thing is, that was a big thing in Startup Academy with Russia, right? Because failing is not a good thing. Your grandmother, your baba comes up and say, don't do that, Dima. Don't do that. You need to be a professor. You need to do this. You need to work for Kamaz or whatever. The thing is, if you don't try, you never know. So part of what Silicon Valley does is supports. Hey, listen, if you, if it, it's not failing, right? It's pivoting your life. Your entire life is about pivoting. If you don't try this, if you don't get this, try something else. So I have Steve Blank's right on target. And, you know, part of the thing is uh, one is you got to try. And the other thing is if it doesn't work out, you try something else. Don't let that rule your life. The negative shit stuff move forward. And you, you alluded to it a little bit in your intro. Talk about, remind people what was happening in 1999, 2000, when you guys, this small company, were one of only two IPOs, Click Software, yeah. during yeah, that so, year. I mean, and I even have a story before that one that I, that I could show, the company that I exited, right? So, uh, but I'll tell you Click Software. So what happened is, we were coming out to the market. The market crashed in March of 2000, completely crashed. And people said we could not do an IPO. The only way we could do it is if we started the, we got a contract with somebody like SAP. So I flew to Germany, to Waldorf, Germany. And I sat and I figured that this guy who's a VP of CRM hung out at a Hofbrau uh, near the campus of uh, SAP. And I basically hung out there and I waited and I knew what he looked like. I found him and I went to him. I got him to agree to, you know, the one thing he said is, I can't believe that you came clear to Germany to, <laughs> to hang out at the Hofbro. I said, I hang out at the Hofbro because I wanted to meet you. I said, because we got the best stuff in the world. And I went to his friend in Berlin. I drove to Berlin from uh, Waldorf. And I met with his friend. I found out who one of his friends uh, is who works for a consulting company. And I had lunch with him. So I got his support. And he said to him, hey, he's a nice guy. Uh, SAP agreed. I had a contract in two weeks. That contract led us to be able to do an IPO on NASDAQ. One of the uh, uh, two or three IPOs that happened uh, after the market crash. Uh, in that year. And again, we sold the company for 1.35 billion six months ago. Now we were number three, there was service power, MDSI, and then click software. So we weren't even a leader. I mean, we were nothing. We're a little tiny company. And then before that, I found another situation. There's a company called Broad Vision. Broad Vision, the CEO was worth $8 billion at the time of the market. He started Siebel Systems, uh, he was original money, Ufida in China, Sinan China. Uh, he's one of the top 100 Chinese. And um, I wanted to start a company. So what I did is I found him and uh, I basically tracked him down out in California. I stayed in the parking lot. I saw him coming into the, I'd been trained quite well in terms of uh, uh, sales school. So I saw him and I walked with him. I said, Pi Hong, Pi Hong Chen. 
And he looked at me, do I know you? Gary, Gary Fowler. And I said, ah, nice to see you again. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, come on in. I'm just gonna have a cup of coffee. You wanna join me? So he became, he's now one of my best friends. So here's a guy that, um, you know, multi, multi-billionaire. He's a partner in my venture fund with me. So it's a matter of having the right grit to figure out who do you need to talk to and how do you develop those kind of uh, uh, relationships. By the way, his company, his stock went from 6000 to seven uh, to over several thousand dollars per share. $6 per share, $6.34 to several thousand. Hit the name... Uh, he did an endowment at Stanford uh, back in the early 2000s, and he was on the cover of Business Week as uh, Man of the Year. So besides what Jewish guys like me call chutzpah, or I refer to as being a pit bull, mm -hmm. I know another thing that you've been very passionate about is using contacts, and you're very good at that. I think you're amongst the best that I've ever seen. But what tactical tips can you give to people to gain contacts in Silicon Valley and globally, and then use those contacts for business success? Yeah. So the thing is you got to figure out what people want, right? I mean, the thing is you want to, your whole motive going into this is how you can help them and what can you do to be able to help their business. So whenever you do that, so I go on uh, LinkedIn or I use my own personal contacts and I get a friend referral most of the time. So they do an introduction for me because if you have a friend referral, that the probability is a lot higher that they're going to respond. The other thing I do is I always call to the top. So if you look at IBM's model, it's call to the top. So I'll go to the CEO just like I did last week with uh, Flair. I mean, I'll go right to the CEO. Who's going to say no below him to talk to you? If you get the CEO convinced that you're interesting, what person in the organization is going to say no? And are they going to give you a hard time once you go down? No. But if you go from the bottom up, yes. So I always start at the top. And, and the thing is, look at, read about the person. What kind of passions do they have? What kind of things do they want? What kind of things do they like? I remember one time, uh, one of the executives was at racing sailboats. And I did a lot of research on sailboat uh, before I met with them. And the guy, the entire conversation was about sailboats. And we cut the deal with ever without, without ever talking about the business. I mean, he had the proposal in front of him, but we never talked about business. We only talked about racing sailboats. So you got to go out, you know, it's, you know, there's an art to it. Um, one of our, uh, one of our uh, employees wrote the book, Business is a Contact Sport. I, uh, contact sport. I highly recommend you read that book because it talks about relationship management. It talks about how to develop those contacts for success because contacts are really your insurance. They care about you. If people know you care about them and you do the right stuff, they're more likely to help you throughout your life, no matter where it is. And I can't tell you how many different times that's come into play for me personally. It's, you know, what does it take to somebody ask for a favor and you go out and reach out and, and do something for them Yes, it takes a little bit of time and you don't expect anything back. But the thing is, people know that you care and they're more apt to help you. So, and it makes the world a nice, a lot better place. One of those contacts you mentioned was uh, Bob Dorf, who you made the dean at Skokoville Business Executive MBA program. But I know that you also did a lot of work with Bob on customer discovery. So let's switch gears a little bit. What did you learn with Bob on customer discovery and learning how to build, build things that customers want? Yeah, sure. So I met, by the way, I met Bob when I told you about Pyeongchen and Broadvision because Bob had one-to-one -one marketing. He had written that book and I met him then. So the guy, the rich Chinese, I met him with Bob at the same time. So 20 some years ago. Anyhow, what did I learn? I learned very valuable thing is customer development is critically important. And one of the things, no matter where the company's located, is that engineers like to over-engineer products. And if people aren't willing to buy it, 
if you don't test the market and you spend a lot of time, that's how you go out of business. So I learned my own thing is that when I did the carpeting in each one of the 15 companies, right? I learned that you better ask your customer what they want, not what you think they want. It, you know, Steve Jobs was lucky. Not everybody gets that lucky. And, and did Bob, did Bob introduce you to Guy Kawasaki or how did you meet him? No, no. So Bob, uh, so Guy Kawasaki, I became friends with Bill Reichert. Uh, Bill Reichert is Guy Kawasaki's partner. Bill uh, Guy Kawasaki, so Guy Kawasaki was coming over to Russia and he didn't know anybody over here. And Bill told me he was coming over. So I had a limousine pick him up at the airport through AmCham. And I took him over to the uh, hotel and I had hired an interpreter to work with him uh, to help him. And then I asked him, I said, hey, Guy, would you mind going on stage with me at Skolkova? And he said, sure. So we did a free event, not $100,000 at Skolkova Business School. And I had 2,000 people or so. I had monitors in the hallways. It was so big. And so I met Guy through uh, him. And Guy introduced me to Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak needed a visa to come to Russia. So Guy was walking in Blossom Hill. And Wozniak was there. And he had Wozniak call me. It's crazy. That's a, how contacts work. He trusts me, knew me, knows me. And, you know, you always keep in touch with them and see how you can help them. If somebody needs something, it's, it's nice to help them. So. And, and then when, when Guy spoke, was that the first time that you met David? No. So I had heard about David before that. David was like the Wizard of Oz you know, this guy behind the curtain, you always heard about him, but no, rarely would people see him unless at his restaurant. So I met him a couple of years prior to that. But what happened is I knew he loved Guy Kawasaki. Guy Kawasaki's his idol. And so I put David in the exact middle. If you look at the pictures uh, of David with the Guy Kawasaki event, I put him right in the center on the first row because I knew I wanted to develop a relationship with him. And then I had a VIP event afterwards, and I had a um, guy bring a book and signed it to David right on the spot. And so that's when it really, because that's something I heard David wanted. David was enamored with God, or is enamored with God. And when he got that, it was like I had pictures taken with him so he could have them framed and all that. And he just loved it. And that's how we deep. We had a relationship, but that's how we deepened our relationship. And then when, when you were living out in Silicon Valley, you reconnected with David out there. What were those early discussions like? This is pre-Eva days uh, between you and David. And, and how did it uh, evolve to Eva? I mean, the thing is, so I'm walking down the street on University in Palo Alto. I see David. I, what's the chance to see him, David Yang on University? Hey, Gary, how are you? It's so nice to see you. He hugs me. We're talking. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm having problems. I've been looking for a co-founder and CEO for this company I want to form. And I haven't been able to find any. I found one guy and it didn't work out. Do you know anybody? And I thought, I think I might know somebody. But let me check it out. So five days later, I came back to them. Two days later, we incorporated a company within a week from the time I saw him. And the reason is because I introduced him to Guy Kawasaki and he liked me and trusted me. I mean, that was it. And what, what was the, the idea in the company at that point that you guys were, were planning to start? So we were doing a Google-like search for the personal cloud. So connecting uh, Dropbox, Box, Slack, et cetera, so you could search it from one place anywhere. So we started with that idea and grew the company. Uh, so in July, I said I wanted, I became the CEO, president, and co-founder of the company. I said I wanted to have AI in it because we didn't have AI. So in two weeks, David came up with uh, this idea of predictive insights and I presented it up in, uh, it was a Moscone Center, I think, uh, in front of thousands of people. 
and it got 300 articles written about it because it was so, this is four years ago. And we didn't even have it at the time. We just mocked up screenshots. So <laughs> it didn't really exist. We had to build it. But the thing is, what happened is we went from, we understood that the market was going to artificial intelligence and that we wanted to be in the forefront of that. So it really helped us out a lot. So it, it sounds like you, you started with this Google-like search engine for, for the cloud, but then at some point in time, you guys decided to pivot to a huge resources analytics product. Well, well it's a great story, right? So the Google-like search for the personal cloud, you know, you know the file exists, but you can't find it. Why? Because the file's either lost or you don't remember the keywords, right? Everybody, where's that PowerPoint presentation? I don't know, is it WhatsApp, Telegram, et cetera? Great problem, you know, so you know there's a pain point. There's a challenge though. What we didn't anticipate is that people don't remember their passwords and they're afraid to give one company access to their passwords. So the problem exists, but they don't want to give you the password. So I get 167,000 customers uh set up but they only would use email addresses like uh, hotmail like aol things that didn't really have the data in it so we had to pivot we knew we had the technology 18 patents that we had to pivot in another direction so i pivoted the company to a task assistant great idea same but you can't fight google and google gives it for free so then we pivoted with the same technology to uh, Eva. Changed the name from Findo, moved it over to Eva, and that's where we are today with it. And Eva is one of the top 10 HR companies today in AI. So kind of going back a little earlier, talk about the fundraising and what that was like raising for a Delaware corporation, but with Russian roots and, and some of the, the challenges and learnings you, you got. Yeah, so that's a good thing. So, so you know, everybody knows David Jang in Russia, pretty much that's in technology. Hardly anybody knows David Jang and they think he was from Yahoo because they get him confused with Jerry Yang. So David and I would go out and do presentations together to raise money. Now imagine going out with a you know billionaire <laughs> and going out uh, uh, to raise money. So what happened is I understood that one of the things that we needed to do is we needed to use resources where people would know David. So I went to uh, VC firms that were, were Israel-based, were uh, Russia-based that would know David, and Flint Capital was uh, the one. So then I also knew that we need to have some Chinese money, and I know with a name like Yang, it's going to you know, be much easier to get Chinese money. So we got some connections with a large Chinese corporation and raised another uh, part of the round from them. What was it like? Uh, so when we started the company in April, by August I'd raised $7 million. And once people knew David, once I start, I had to like cheerlead for David. Once we cheerleaded, then it became much easier because they started doing research over Abby and Cybico and Ico, et cetera. So it became, it became much easier. And they had to, in terms of being a Russian company, the way you position is quite simple. You got the best R&D in the world and the prices are right. So it's a mixed team. You know, I talk about intergenerational, multicultural, regionally diverse teams. I mean, that's it, right? Because you got the best R&D work in the world. Why not get the best sales, marketing, business development, operations teams to supplement that? and ones that have context. So the model is just a, re that's the repeatable model. And that's a model that works. Awesome. And um, what, talk a little bit more about the, the what you just mentioned, the, the article on integrated teams with seasoned veterans. What else have you seen to kind of lead you to that thesis that that helps? Because the thing is, nobody's really talking about it, right? It's incredible. Intergenerational teams. I just had a conversation with some folks from MIT and Stanford last week, uh, recent graduates. 
And they love the idea because it's a missing link. You don't have the experience and these people that have the experience, uh, they don't necessarily have the contact with them. So why not bridge the gap? So it's not only about regionally diverse, Russia, the US, uh, it's also bringing in that talent that can help you with the contacts, right? It's about, it is about contacts because people trust you. It's about trust. And so having people that they know in Silicon Valley that have trusted and a track worker, they can Google your name, makes it a whole lot easier to raise money and a whole lot easier to develop partnerships because they take you seriously. It's not like some scam, who is this? Is this uh, KGB, is this that? I mean, all kinds of different uh, things. It eliminates them. The other thing is bringing some of the top talent in like the Rick Orloffs of the world, the former chief security officer at Apple and eBay, uh, having people that have name brand recognition like Bill Reichert, I mean, they can't, they're, it, you have a trust network already set up. So the difference between success and failure sometimes, you can have the best product in the world. Was it MySpace, right? <laughs> you can have great products to the world. You can be first mover. But if you can't really, if you don't have the right stuff and the right contacts, you're not going to go anywhere with this thing. So it's critically important. Yeah, I think we talk a lot about that together, about bridging the attraction gap. Um, I wrote an article on kind of my thoughts on GSD and anyone could hear it, but maybe just for those that haven't heard from you, how did you kind of culminate all of this into the vision of GSD? I mean, because the thing is, it's a natural extension of what I did with Skokal, the Startup Academy and GBA, right? So what happened is I understood once my students started to come back and say, Gary, can you help like you did with David Jang? Can you help me with my company? And it wasn't one, it was many. I want to come to, I want to go global. I want to do what you did with Eva and can you help? And so what happened once that started to happen multiple times and once we met out in California last year, I mean, the situation was I needed to find, find somebody that was as crazy as me to be able to go out and do it. That's, you know, not afraid. And who else is better than a guy that's been in uh, combat in Afghanistan and Iraq? I mean, somebody that's got the right stuff that's not afraid and smart. Somebody that knows how to get stuff done. So, and is passionate about it. So you look at it. I mean, those are the links, right? Having the passion. Now it's even better. Now it's more important because the companies that aren't decentralized, that aren't located in multiple locations during this pandemic have problems. So why not have a trusted network that already has a location set up that you know has uh, the uh, groups uh, in Russia or the Ukraine or Belarus that can support you? It's like the best of both worlds. You need it. So decentralized teams are, I talked about this months ago decentralized teams. Now it's like, it's, you know, the theme. In fact, my next start at going Forbes is about that. <laughs> it's like the time. So, you know, the thing is, guys, this is the best time I've ever seen for companies to go global. Why? Because your competitors are afraid. And there's a lot, a lot of money that's pent up that wants to spend. We've been talking to SoftBank, to Insight Partners. They did Veeam for 5 billion. Uh, to Greylock, to General Catalyst Partners, a lot of them, a lot of the private equ equity folks and investment bankers. So there are some that saying their money's on the sidelines. Those are the, there aren't uh, as many as you would think. Most of them are being aggressive. Yes, they do discounting of 20%. Who cares? It doesn't matter, you get out. Click software, they said, oh, you're so stupid. Why would you wanna do an IPO now? It's bad times. And the thing is, we raised money, not a lot at the time, 28 million. It kept us going forward and we sold for a billion three. That's not bad. So now's the time. And you look at some of the greatest companies out there, the Twitters of the world, right? They started in times that were down. This is the time to be able to get your teams in place, get those partnerships lined up. They're reaching out all the time. I mean, so we're in continuing discussion. I've never seen a time 
ever. And I'm pretty good at getting the top executives. Uh, uh, and I've never seen a time that they respond as much as they do today, ever. CEOs of multi, multi-billion dollar companies, you know, sending things through LinkedIn. And because they're lonely, I think, and want to talk. I don't know. It's weird. I just had one right before this call, by the way. Somebody reached out to me. Very, very successful. <laughs> So I think it's the time, guys, but you got to do it. This is not about haphazard. You got to do it in a structured fashion, but at the same time, you've got to have those soft qualities, you know, not be afraid. You got to build those intergenerational teams, multicultural teams, regionally diverse teams, decentralized teams. And guess what? This is not the end. This is just the beginning of the opportunities for each and every one of you out there. This is the beginning. And I did it before. You can go out and look at it. Look at Startup Academy. They told us we were going to fail. Nobody's, no Russians are going to want to go to Silicon Valley. They're not going to happen. They're not going to want to learn from these guys like Bob Dorf and Steve Blank and Guy Kawasaki, et cetera. And guess what? It happened. GVA. It's not going to work. It's never going to happen. Uh, you can't do a private accelerator. What are you going to do with it and what? It's what? Just listed number one private accelerator in the world, corporate accelerator. So, you know, we can seed it. You can seed it to make it go forward. But having the financials lined up, having your legal lined up, having your team lined up, having a no-nonsense approach to this thing lined up, having positive attitude, you know, not being negative about this stuff, Yes, there's things, always stuff going on. If we look at the, the, this as being half empty, it's one thing. You can't see it. But if you look at a cup being half empty, it's one thing. I'm looking at being half full. If, you, if you're positive, positive things happen for you. Each and every one of you, all the time. Every single day. I'd cut out for a second. Hey, Gary, where did you grow up? I grew up on a mountain in Pennsylvania in a village of 2,000 people. Someone had asked the real estate construction, did you do that in Pennsylvania or Silicon Valley? No, I did that in Pennsylvania in uh, State College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, in a little town, right? People said you could never sell houses for, you know, then three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and I did it. So, yeah, I grew up in a town in the, on the side of a mountain in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, it was a redneck town in Pennsylvania overlooking a river. And so, I mean, we had bears in the backyard the whole night. It was a real country town. We had uh, a school, elementary school, that had one grade and one teacher for each grade. So there were 20 to 30 students in a class. It was really small. So if I can do it, if I can do it, God, you guys are a lot smarter than me. You can do anything. But having the grit or chutzpah or whatever we want to call it and having the right stuff is, is critically important. You know, think out of the box and visualize what you want. And you've traveled all across Russia, speaking uh, from large cities like Moscow and St. Pete, but across Russia. Is that true? Yeah, to Vladivostok, Karbarsk, Kutsk, Nizhny Tagil, Nizhny Novgorod, uh, Yoshkar Ala, Kazan. I mean, all over. I lived in St. Petersburg. I had a girlfriend in Kaliningrad. I mean, I've been, I've been around the block. Uh, Kursk, Murmansk, I mean, you name it. I've seen a lot of this incredible country, a lot of really smart and amazing people who've been very nice to me, by the way. So I just want to um, open it up to the group and see if anyone has any questions uh, for you about everything, anything you discussed or anything you haven't discussed. Sure. Uh, guys, feel free to turn on your camera uh, uh, and ask your question. Uh, so, well, well this, there is opportunity to talk with Gary. Uh, somebody asked how many times you fly to the U.S. in a year? I well, I'm in the... I'm in the uh, U.S., so how many times do I come to Russia? Normally, I come once a month. And I li have a house in Silicon Valley, a place that I live in Silicon Valley, and also in uh, Florida. Thank you.
Any questions? Yeah, Gary. Hi, my name is Hi. Aidos. I'm from Kazakhstan. Just one question. Have you ever been to Kazakhstan? Yeah, I've been to Kazakhstan, to Almaty, and Astana. Actually, many times. Yeah, I love it. Actually, Astana, I did uh, with Lawrence Wright. I would go down there and do like uh, uh, startup weekends and things with Lawrence. So I did a lot of speaking down there. Is that where yeah. you're located? Yeah, Almaty, Kazakhstan, right? Yeah, Almaty is beautiful. I love it down there. Oh, love thanks. it. Yeah. Yeah, you guys, you know, the thing is, we don't see a lot of startups at uh, GSD from Kazakhstan. And I know your ecosystem's really developing. It would be really cool to, to see more of you um, going out to the valley. I don't see many in Silicon Valley either, by the way. And I know you have the talent. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Hopefully, we will reach this. <laughs> okay. Not hopefully. Remember, you don't use hope in Silicon Valley. It's a bad thing. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. you got to believe, really, seriously, if you don't say hope or maybe, uh, you got to say, I believe in it, you know, I'm going to do it. Because in Silicon Valley, if you say uh, hope or maybe, it means you're not going to do it. Oh, okay, I see. Thanks. Thank yeah, yeah, sure. Anytime. Who else has a question? You can also type it if you're too shy to come on. <laughs> okay, so I remember you talked in scope of about cost difference software engineers, Silicon Valley versus Russia. Can you elaborate? Yes. So uh, an engineer in Silicon Valley, depending, uh, I'm, we're into artificial intelligence, so it could be $200,000, $250,000 uh, per year versus what, depending upon where you are in Russia, three to $6,000 uh, per month. But it's not only the cost, it's the level of the capabilities of the engineers. The engineers, uh, just from my own personal perspective, the AI engineers and programmers in Russia are far, far ahead of what's in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, you got to look at it this way. One of the things that's really cool is that when you use these mix you know, multicultural, regionally diverse teams, everybody wins. So one of the things that we're proponent of, and I am personally, and so is Derek, is to make sure that in each one of the teams that people are rewarded with uh, stock and, and treated fairly. So we, you want to do the right stuff, you know, and that's how you really grow the company. You want to, I wrote in my article that just came out on Forbes last week, I talked about you know, what in times of uncertainty and having the agility, but the one thing is, you know, treating people the right way because it comes back in spades. Uh, I don't know what, uh, I just got Ildar just wrote me. Do you have cost differences in embedded software such as Linux and microcontrollers? I'm sure there's a cost difference, but I don't know how much it is. I don't know exactly what the, uh, cost differences, but I'm sure it's, uh, you know, substantial. Hi, Gary, I have some questions. Sure. Thank you, first of all, for this uh, meetup, for this webinar. So, uh, first uh, question what for is, you. What is your name? My name is Ksenia. And where are you from, Ksenia? <laughs> I'm from uh, Pridnistrovia, some unrecognized state in Moldova. Don't you know it? Uh, yeah, I've been to Chis now. I've spoken down there, but I haven't been. Uh, no, I haven't been to that. Transnester, is that where it is? Yeah. Yeah, I know Transnester. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, my question is, what are your teachers or mentors? And what is a genius startup for you? ever your teachers and the genius uh, startups uh so the question is what is the i um who's the best or i'm not sure what yeah who is the best and uh who are you trust i mean the situation is you gotta so in terms of uh teachers and mentors mine personally have been guys like uh, this P. Hong Chen that I talked about. Um, 
it's people, you know, everybody has something they can give to you, Ksenia. They have something you can learn from. So you want to look for people that uh, they can help you and you can help them, right? So uh, in terms of my mentors, uh, Bob Dorf is a mentor of mine. Guy Kawasaki is a mentor of mine. Bill Reichert's a mentor of mine. Dan Neal is a mentor of mine. I mean, it's anybody, everybody that's out there that can provide you with information to be able to help you be better, right? And that's literally everybody. So look for those grains that uh, can help. And then look where people have had proven success. Uh, David Yang, who's my partner in EVA, is a mentor of mine. I mean, there's a lot that he knows that I don't know. But what we do is we share. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And sure. another question I have. <laughs> sure. Okay, uh, what do you think about stock options? Uh, we are thinking about them and uh, what is the best uh, scheme of distributing them in startup? Yes, yeah, so what you want to do is you want to set about 20%, 15 to 20% of the company up uh, of the employee, for employee stock options, right? You want to make sure you have that set up and you also want to make sure you have advisory board shares set up. And Ksenia, it's really important that you do it to, to uh, norm uh, like in Silicon Valley. There, there are norms and ways to set it up because it'll affect any type of future investment if you don't set it up correctly. So 15 to 20% uh, is the normal amount that you would have as an employee stock option pool. And there is no uh, one scheme for all, yeah? No, I mean, 15 to 20%, but you got to, so there's, you know, you have to allocate, you know, whatever 10, 20 million shares of stock at a very low uh, value because you're going to have to, per each person in the company is going to have to purchase them. It's better to do it, Ksenia, before you raise funds because there's some uh, legal rules that apply once there's investment in the company and how much you can pay for the stock. So you, you want to make sure you have a good attorney. Like, um, are you are are you global yet, or where where's your company located? Is no, it, our company is uh, located in Russia, but we won't go global, of course. And uh, first, you, in the U.S. Yeah. So the situation is, once you come to the U.S. side, you want to make sure the infrastructure is set up. You know, you want to make sure you have um, uh, the right kind of uh, uh, accountants lined up you know it's not hard but it's just something they have to do because if you do it wrong it takes a lot of time to unwind it to fix it so make sure that you have your stock pool set up make sure you have the number of shares allocated make sure you generally don't want to have any more than three founders of the company i mean you can if you can explain it but uh, three founders is fundable um, i would do a delaware corporation with a entity in Silicon Valley, because, you know, that's where the action is for uh, uh, technology companies in general. And that's the structure, right? 15 to 20%, 10 to $20 million worth of stock, uh, 15 to 20% employee stock pool, and then advisory shares, because you want advisors that can help you. Okay, I see, I see. And the last question, and uh, it will be enough for me, I think. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? Uh, is it uh, real to get investment in the U.S. and uh, do business there while staying in Russia or in Moldova abroad? I mean, the situation is I'm doing it right now for companies, and I'm dealing with companies like SoftBank, right? The the top VC firms in the world. I mean, they're just looking for really cool stuff. It's just you got to make sure that the company is set up is a U.S. corp. The reason you want to set up is U.S. corporation because of the body of law, right? They want to know that somebody's not going to take their money and run off. They want to make sure that if there's an issue, that they have the court infrastructure to be able to uh, pursue it, right? They want to make sure they're they're protected, and um, that's why Delaware is the state of choice uh, globally, right? And then then California. So yes, I mean they're. People are aggressively invested in Russian companies. I just talked to Igor Rabinke last week, right? They're aggressively investing. 
And Eager is one of the top, what, angel investors, Daniel? Is he considered an angel or super angel? Ulrike Ryabinki? Yeah. Um, he is uh, between the angel and venture capital. He's an angel himself, himself but yeah. he- So, I mean, he's aggressive. He, he did, what, capital. Mira last week? Was it uh, Miro or Mira, one of his companies? Miro. Miro. I mean, it's what they raised, 50 million or something like that. Right. And he was one of the investors, right? Right. I mean, that's what he told me last week. So the investment's taking place. You just got to get on the wagon and do the, uh, you know, go for it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answers. Yeah, no problem. And then Tatiana, I see Tatiana. What kind of trends do you see for the next year or two and which industries will be grow? Well, look at where we are right now, Tatiana. Look at how we're online, how the world's changed. Four years ago, um, I met this, was it Eric Yuan from Zoom he, through Emergence Capital. Now, he was telling about it. He had worked at Cisco and this AI, he was going to come up with the product we're on today. Now, think about how many people are using Zoom now. How life has changed. It's, it, there's one is a physical contact level. The other thing is this online reality that we have today, which is fantastic because it's where we should have been 10 years ago. Think about how much money, how inefficient we've been in business because of having to travel and things. So look at anything that you can do uh, online, right? You can, any kind of technology that's online based, learning, uh, education, uh, consulting, that kind of thing. So I would go there. The other thing is, which I'm a huge proponent of, is artificial intelligence. Why? because each one of us here is inundated with information every day. Each person with uh, Findo, we looked at how much information each person has in their personal cloud. It's about 300,000 uh, pieces of information. The entire World Wide Web in the early 90s, right, was in 1994 or five, was 257,000 websites. Each person is inundated. Every year, that amount of information doubles. In five years, you'll have 10 million pieces of information. How in the world, as an individual, are you going to be able to filter all that information? You need tools like artificial intelligence to be able to help. So, and it's going to be across multiple industries. It'll be medical, transportation, I mean, you name it. So it'll touch almost every part of our lives. So anything where you can increase the efficiencies using AI will be uh, hugely important. So that's what I would, I would look at that. Um, and then cool things like battery technology, things that, you know, people are, you know, they need to change because of what the new Tesla Roadster gets 620 miles per charge, right? So efficiencies with things like batteries, solar, uh, et cetera. Other questions? I may ask a question, please. Sure. Okay, uh, my name is Slava. I'm a shy tech guy from Moscow <laughs> uh, who's dreaming to be CEO, of course. <laughs> and my question is, uh, what are the most important uh, personal uh, qualities uh, for a leader of a startup, tech startup? I mean, the situation is, you know, from, so now with this decentralization, you got to look at people that are fair. You want to find people that, from my standpoint, have open minds because you don't have all the answers. And there are other people, you, one thing you want to do is make sure that you have, you're collecting uh, feedback from everybody that's part of your team. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, you can lead the company better. So it's not like before where you have these hierarchical structures where you have the, you know, the, the, the uh, CEOs on the top of the mountain, it's like it's a more level playing field. And because of decentralization, it's a lot different. You gotta trust people, right? And people have to know that you care about them and trying to do the right stuff. So as a CEO, of course, you need to be able to do public speaking slava. You need to be able to go in front of, to be a great CEO, you wanna be able to get in front of thousands of people and convey your message. So practice speaking, right? Speaking engagements. And uh, that's important. Uh, you got to make sure that, you know, Bill Gates said that the, what he does is he hires people that are smarter than him 
and that's what I do too. <clears throat> you always look for people that are smarter for you, smarter than you. And that's how you make a good team. Okay, thank you very much. Sure, anytime. Okay, who else do we have here? Yeah, I, suggest you're welcome. We, I suggest we talk for another 10 minutes because we were planning to finish at five uh, o'clock. Uh, yeah, sure. 5.30. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, before I, uh, others uh, ask. Um, uh, can you uh, elaborate uh, more about uh, reputation thing? Like uh, why it's important for a startup? Like uh, 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 there is a phrase fake it till you make it, but also there is a reputation big deal in Silicon Valley. Why is it a big deal and uh, why people, some people really care a lot about that? Because if your reputation gets sullied, you will not raise money. It's a very, very, very small community in Silicon Valley. And if you do something bad to people, the word gets around and you will be blacklisted. You will not do, you'll never know that it happened because I see those uh, things come by. You know, I, I talk to people about it. You will not know what happened, but it'll happen. And one you're out of favor in Silicon Valley, it's really difficult to get back in favor. I mean, there are, you know, Steve Jobs is one example where it can happen, but there aren't a lot of Steve Jobs out there that has, has his kind of, uh, you know, mental fortitude. So the one, th I mean, reputation is critically important because that's how people trust you. And if you don't treat people fairly, they don't want to do business with you anymore. I mean, it's very simple. They just won't. And you never know. My one friend told me, Gary, you meet the same people going down as you do coming up. So you're going to see those people again. Why not maintain a relationship so you can have a future partnership with them? You can do business with them. Thank you, Gary. Okay, Eldar. Uh, failures don't spoil the startup's reputation. Uh, no, as long as you've learned lessons, Eldar. You got to learn lessons from what uh, you've done. And if you've learned those lessons and people believe in you, it's not about uh, you being bad, it's about the wrong place at the wrong time, that's okay. I mean, the thing is, it's accepted. In the Valley, it's totally accepted. And it should be accepted in Russia and Kazakhstan too, by the way. I mean, what's one of the things I've been a proponent of throughout the Startup Academy and GBA is, you know, it's not a bad thing. You learn a lot, you know. And again, it's not failing, it's pivoting. When you go down the road and you, you make a mistake and miss a turn and you got to do a U-turn, is that a failure? right if you crash it's a failure but if you do a u-turn because you made a mistake that's okay hey it takes a little longer but you get to the same place well guess what that's what doing a, a startup site it's about making some changes did i fail with uh findo no we pivoted to use the same stuff repackaged it look for another environment customer development didn't work moved on to eva one of the top 10 ai hr companies in the world today so you got to try. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Can I yep. ask another yes. question? Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Gary, uh, what is your personal red flags to the startup, except the, the obvious one, for example, if, if the founders are trying to run two startups or they have some bad reputation, what the other, or, or the absence of traction? What are the I other mean, the red flags? So, so we're, what we're looking at personally, what I'm looking at is growth stage startups now. So ones that already have traction and revenue and the team's really serious about going global because if I'm going to put my reputation, or we're going to put our reputations online, we got to make sure the startup's really serious about it, right? And so uh, I look for people that, that have a healthy track record that have done things before and uh, don't want to ruin their reputation uh, either. We look for people that are open-minded, that um, understand there are different ways of doing business. Uh, we look for people that have, as I said, some revenue, right? You need to, we want to make sure that they have product market fit and some revenue. And the other thing is we want to look at the market to make sure that it's a global market and it's not something that's going to be really regional and not, um, not be able to move, uh, not be able to go global. So we're looking strong teams are critically important. 
what we're, what we're, what I'm looking for right now is I'm looking for strong R and D. We can take care of a lot of the other stuff, the operational stuff. We can do a lot of that. We can set up the legal structure, et cetera. But I want to make sure that we've got the best technical team in the world to back it up. And ones that are really, really dedicated to the project. They're not going to leave, you know, I mean, on one side, I don't care how many startups they have. I only care if what we're working on together, they're focused. It doesn't matter. I mean, David Yang's got multiple, multiple companies. I mean, we did EVA together. So it's a matter of uh, how dedicated to this project and how good. So if it's AI, is it the best AI? Is it unsupervised AI? Is it variational out encoders or ladder networks? Is it solving a very important problem today? And is it... Uh, are they doing it um, so that you've done customer development? They know that people really want to buy it or, or uh, use it. So okay. that's what we look for today. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Okay, I think that's uh, Daniel. Anything else? Any more questions? Uh, so we have like three, four minutes left. Uh, if you want to ask Gary any other question, yeah, I mean, I just want to say, I mean, all the startups out there and all the companies, guys, this is truly the opportunity of a lifetime because people are afraid and they're doing things. They're being very reactionary and they're not going at this market right. And that fear that's driving them is, is bad because the, you don't want to, it's, it's not the time to contract. It's just time to look for opportunities. You know, Warren Buffett says, listen, he goes to the, the opposite direction of the market because that's where you make money. If everybody's going after this one stock, right, what happens? You're not going to get a deal. Look where there's opportunities. Now the situation, if you want to go global, how do you do it? Well, you need, to have, you need to have a great product, a great team, but you also need a relationships uh, globally well, and to be decentralized. That's where you need to be. And so uh, we see these times. I saw it in um, the 2000s. I saw it in the 90s. I saw it in 2008. I mean, it's, this is just another opportunity. And it's a place where you can make the most amount of money, by the way. And have fun. Yeah. All right. Um... So uh, there is a quick question about this session today. Uh, uh, tell us uh, how did you, how much did you enjoy this conversation? Uh, so it was fun. It was good. By the way, Tatiana has one. How many uh, were you invested and how many won? So uh, how many? So in terms of invested or part of? So I'll give you a, a couple different answers. So in terms of companies died, I sold my portion of companies and a couple of years. So I started a company called Broadian. The market changed. I had already sold my position in it. The market just died because of the um, recession. And so um, I didn't count that as a failure. I knew when it was time to get out, I did it. Uh, I have had pain, enormous pain because I didn't do my customer development. And I remember sitting on an investment for three years and spending, I don't know, several hundred thousand dollars and it was painful. I got out of it and I made about 10%, but it wasn't any fun, believe me. So um, uh, how many of them that I've invested in have died? I've had, the, the worst scenario is, the situation is that when the startups, for whatever reason, they want to change direction and they decide to take a very conservative approach. So those companies don't die, but they're like in, um, in um, suspended animation. In terms of uh, most of the companies, if you pivot, you can grow them. You, look at Slack, right? Stuart Buttersfield was doing games. I talked to him directly about it. And then they were using Slack as a tool. Look at Slack today, right? So, uh, yeah, 
they're, of course, they're, when I was in startup, we did startup academy, there were companies that were early stage that started and some of the students joined other companies. I don't know, their idea, they wanted to do something else. I would say probably, you know, if you look at it today, in terms of uh, startups failing, it's like nine out of 10, but none of the ones that I've been involved in or sold have uh, failed. None of them have failed. Some didn't grow like they should, but none of them failed, right? Or they've been acquired, like Click Software. So, yeah, I've been lucky. Real, real lucky. Sure, you're welcome, Tatiana. Thank you. Uh, and, and the thing is, you never know when these companies that you're working on, the market changed like in Click Software times. That was nothing. I, I wouldn't have thought at the time it would be a, a billion dollar company. I mean, because we literally was like having the conversation today here, but it did. But we responded to the market. You got to make sure they're responding, making changes. So we started, we were number three, then we became the number two company, then we became the number one company. And I used channel partnerships are critically important because I didn't, we didn't have to put money in sales and marketing. We put money in developing the channel partners and that really helped a lot. All right, everyone, thank you for coming to our exciting event. I think uh, there was a lot of great uh, questions. Uh, uh, yeah, if you guys, listen, if you guys have any questions, feel free to write me. You know, you guys, you're, uh, keep going forward, stay positive, believe in your dreams. We can help at GSD. I'm happy to answer questions. Feel free to write me personally on Facebook or LinkedIn or my email. I'm happy to do what I can to help you out. I believe in you guys. Keep your dreams. Stay happy, stay focused, and uh, stay safe. Thank you, Gary. So the only reason we are, try we are doing these events is to help uh, Russian-speaking uh, entrepreneurs to uh, go global. And uh, uh, Gary is trying hard, Eric is trying hard. So we built the community for the people who are starting companies. Uh, our next events uh, will be very soon. Um, the next one will be on uh, April the 30th. Uh, we'll talk about how to research uh, the competition with uh, Andrew Wasserman, a great guy, really very smart. And um, uh, so feel free to reach us out. Uh, you have my contacts as well. So if you want to, uh, if you have questions about uh, the community and you want to contribute, the community is uh, uh, about helping each other. Uh, the one of the core things of Silicon Valley is to give away, uh, give back, and uh, give back first, and then expect something else. So we are giving back to you this community. So you guys also start helping each other, ask questions, ask, demand for resources, ask others if, if they can help. We will really be excited uh, if you start helping each other, and we will help you as well if we can. Um, on this note, uh, I thank, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for this conversation. It was really valuable. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. See you later. Take care. Uh, Stay safe. I'll post, I'll post the video uh, in the channel. And uh, once, uh, once on our YouTube, uh, please like and subscribe and uh, give us comments. All right. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.